In the alternate version of exercise 4.7, we're going to record three separate transactions using a perpetual inventory system in the gross method. First, from the buyer's perspective of Sydney Retailing, and second set of entries is going to be for Troy Wholesalers, the seller. On May the 11th, our first entry, we look at our transaction. Sydney is going to accept delivery of $50,000 worth of merchandise it purchases for resale from Troy. The invoice is dated the same day, May the 11th. The terms are 310 net 90, meaning they could potentially have a 3% purchase discount if they pay the invoice within 10 days, otherwise they're obligated to pay the invoice within 90 days. The FOB terms are FOB shipping point, which meant title transferred to Sydney. Upon it leaving Troy's dock, they were responsible for it, which indicates that Sydney, the buyer, ultimately is responsible for paying any freight charges. We can skip over for now that the cost of the goods to Troy were $30,000. That means Troy paid $30,000 to source the goods, but that will be become important later when we record the perspective from the seller. I'm also going to ignore just for a couple minutes our shipping charges until we first record the entry related to the purchase itself. Again, the buyer and the seller use a perpetual inventory system. That means we're going to keep a running track record of merchandise inventory. We're going to show the increases and decreases to merchandise inventory. At any point in time, our asset merchandise inventory and our balance sheet should truly reflect the cost of goods we have available for sale. To be able to do that, when we purchase and receive in items, we need to show an increase to our asset account merchandise inventory, which we're going to show as a debit for $50,000. We also need a credit side and we have not yet paid these items so we're going to show a credit to accounts payable a liability we increase it with a credit for $50,000 and notate that this is related to the purchase of merchandise on credit terms 310 not 90. Now I'd mentioned that we have some shipping charges. Sydney was obligated to pay shipping because of the FOB shipping terms and they paid $500 cash to express shipping for delivery charges on your merchandise. Now, so we'll have a second entry on May the 11th. Your inclination might be that we should debit some type of shipping expense. That seems natural, but Keep in mind that in regards to inventory, anything that we have to pay in order to get that item ready and available for sale in regards to inventory is going to be part of the cost of the merchandise inventory. So we need to include that within the merchandise inventory account so it reflects anything like shipping charges, taxes, tariffs, again, anything related to getting that item to the location and ready for sale is going to be part of merchandise inventory. So we're also going to debit merchandise inventory for the cost of the shipping charges or $500. And this time we're crediting cash because we are paying it out immediately for $500 to express shipping. And we're going to notate that we paid shipping charges on purchased goods. On May the 12th, Sydney um, was perhaps unhappy or received um, maybe was a little bit overstacked on items. So they returned 4,000 of the 50,000 they originally purchased from Troy. Troy received them the same day and it was good items so they restored them to their inventory. Now, ultimately, again, we're a perpetual inventory system. We need to keep a running track record of our merchandise inventory. So we need to reflect the fact that we've lowered merchandise inventory. We also need to reflect the fact no matter that we no longer owe um, Troy as much from Sydney's perspective. So we're going to debit the liability account accounts payable to lower it by the $4,000 worth of goods that we return. And we're also crediting merchandise inventory because we no longer have these items on our shelves in order to sell by crediting it also for $4,000. The description is going to mention return goods. This is the journal entry for physical returns. This would also be the same entry if this was an allowance instead of a return. What I mean by an allowance is some type of price concession that the seller ultimately makes it, because the buyer's not happy about something. Maybe the items were received and they were damaged. Maybe they just weren't exactly what they wanted in terms of size or color. Um, 
maybe neither the buyer or the uh, or the seller want to go to the trouble of actually returning the items or the expense. Um, sometimes it's a hefty amount depending upon what uh, type of item that we're talking about to get the item shipped back and get it restocked and, and back on the shelves of the seller. So they come to some an agreement and the seller offers some type of discount to say, ultimately I'll lower the sales price to you in order to keep for you to keep those goods. We would still have the same debit to accounts payable because we're lowering the obligations. You may originally think, well, should I really credit merchandise inventory because I'm not physically sending something back. But keep in mind the value of the inventory you have, you lowered it because they've lowered the obligation, you've lowered the cost, so you would still credit merchandise inventory. So their perpetual inventory system from the buyer's perspective, no matter if it's a return or allowance, you're still going to credit merchandise inventory. Finally, we come along to May the 20th and Sydney is going to pay Troy for any outstanding amount owed. So let's start to build our journal entry. We're going to debit accounts payable because we're lowering the obligation. First, we have the original $50,000 they invoiced us, but we're going to lower it by the $4,000 return, meaning we're only going to debit accounts payable an additional $46,000 to bring that outstanding balance down to zero. We also need to factor in that we paid within the 10-day window. Originally invoiced on the 11th, we're offered 3% if we pay within 10 days. The 20th was within that 10 day window. So we need to start to calculate our discount. $46,000 outstanding balance times 3%, same thing as saying 0.03, 3%, gives us a purchase discount from the buyer's perspective of $1,380. You might start to question, I understand it's a discount, but why are you crediting it to merchandise inventory? It's considered a reduction of the cost of the inventory. Ultimately, you, you didn't pay your seller that discount amount of $1,380, so we consider it a reduction in the cost of this asset, so we credit it. We also need to not forget to credit cash because we paid out cash. The amount that we credit to cash is going to be their original $46,000 um, amount that's outstanding in accounts payable minus our discount of $1,380 is going to leave us with a credit to cash of $44,620. These are going to be our entries from the perspective of the buyer. Let's look at the same transactions from the perspective of our seller. This is going to get a little bit more complicated on the seller's perspective. What you've been used to at this point is service companies, which traditionally when there's a sale, we only have one set of entries. Let's look at that first. Let's first pretend like Troy Company is a regular service a company like we've covered before. So on May the 11th, like you've seen before, we would debit accounts receivable and asset because they haven't yet paid it for the sales price of $50,000. We would also credit sales for $50,000 and we would notate this is a sale of merchandise on credit terms 310 net 90. So, so far so good. Seems very similar to your service companies in the past. But what's different is we're a merchandiser now. We have tangible goods that we're providing to our buyer and we're using a perpetual inventory system. So again, we need to keep that perpetual running balance in our inventory account so that our inventory in the balance sheet shows the correct amount that we have um, available for sale. We also, in addition to that, need to reflect the cost or expense the items we no longer have and match that against our sale. So we complicate things a little bit in that our sales have a second transaction. We're going to debit the expense account cost of goods sold. We get a little tricky that it's an expense account, even though it doesn't have the word expense. Um, that is true to the nature of its name is the cost of the merchandise that we sold. We're going to debit it for $30,000. That's the original cost to Troy for those particular items. We also need to lower or decrease the merchandise inventory account because we no longer have $30,000 worth of goods. So we're going to credit merchandise inventory for $30,000. 
and we're going to reflect this with the description and record cost of sales. From the seller's perspective, they're not worried about freight because it was FOB shipping point. They have no responsible for paying it or recording as far as a journal entry, so we're going to ignore that. Again, we come along on the 12th and Sydney was unhappy with 4,000 of their $50,000 worth of goods purchased and the cost of those goods to Troy is 2,400. So somewhat similar to what we did on the buyer's perspective when we had a return, we looked at our original entry and we did a reversal. We're gonna do somewhat similar, similar but with a little bit of a twist. Instead of debiting sales, because ultimately this is a reduction of items that we sold, we're going to debit a contra revenue account called sales returns and allowances. You might say, why in the world do you complicate things even more and not just debit the sales account directly? Well, if you think about it from a seller's perspective, it would be good to have a running balance of our true sales, what really went out to customers, and also have a handle in the separate contra revenue account of what's actually been returned or what allowances we provided to those particular sellers. So we have a true understanding if this item returns and allowances tends to get out of control. When we say contra revenue account, we mean it's related to the sales or revenue account, but on the other hand, it has contra opposite the normal balance, meaning instead of being credited in order to increase it, we're going to debit it in order to increase it. So sales and returns and allowances, we're going to debit for $4,000. Um, we're going to credit accounts receivable because we're ultimately lowering the obligation for $4,000 and notate we accepted returns. Again, this is just a sale portion. I'll also note on the income statement, we would show sales and then subtract sales returns and allowances from it in order to get a true net sales. We also have a second side where we originally showed the expense of the items we sold and the reduction of inventory, but now we're physically getting those items back. So on May the 12th, we're going to have a second entry. We're going to debit merchandise inventory because we mentioned we get them back and restore it to inventory and the cost of those items restored is $2,400. So debit merchandise inventory for $2,400. On the other side, we no longer have that expense related to them because they're no longer sold. So we need to reduce the expense account cost of goods sold by crediting it for $2,400 and notate this is related to return goods to inventory. Now on the buyer's perspective, I mentioned some stipulations because it was a return. I also mentioned that from the seller's perspective. With the return of goods where you're getting tangible items back. Your entry is going to be related to this. It might change a little bit if some of those goods are defective. Um, on the other hand, if this had been an allowance instead of a return where a concession was given, we would have the first journal entry, but on the other hand, we wouldn't have the second journal entry. So if, for example, Troy said, hey, I know you're not totally happy with it. I'm going to reduce $4,000 off your ultimate $50,000 invoice. Um, we would still have the first journal entry, but we would admit the second one because they would not physically be receiving anything back. On May the 20th, then Sydney is going to pay Troy for the whole entire amount owed. And I'm going to do this journal entry a little bit backwards in that I'm going to look at the credit first. Accounts receivable, we need to lower that. Remember the original $50,000 amount invoice, but lowered by the $4,000 amount return. So the outstanding amount in accounts receivable is $46,000, so we're going to credit it by $46,000. Similar to the buyer's perspective where we need to record the cash discount somehow because we're using the gross method. Remember that 3% discount on that $46,000. We'll also need to reflect that on the seller's perspective, but it's going to be done a little bit different. Let's look at the calculation. $46,000 outstanding times a 3% discount or times 0.03 also gives us a discount of $1,380. This time it's called a sales discount. From the seller's perspective, it's a sales discount. From the buyer's perspective, it's a purchase discount. 
And this time, instead of being shown as a reduction in the cost of merchandise inventory in the buyer's perspective, it's reflected as a debit to the contra revenue account called sales discounts. Similar to sales returns and allowances, it's a contra revenue account. It's shown as a reduction on the income statement from sales. So we debit sales discount, normal opposite the balance of sales, so we increase it with a debit. We have to also show an increase of cash because we haven't done that yet. So our original $46,000 in, in cash we had anticipated, again, we need to reduce that by the $1,380 discount. Um, we can also say we can treat that as multiplying the 46,000 times the 97% gets us an increase to cash of $44,620.